Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be reading from this book called Habitats of the World. This is actually a little encyclopedia series. Let me show you. So you can see this is volume two by Call to Coral Reef. And I picked this one because for this month of December, I am doing viewer requested topics and a viewer requested something about Lake Baikal, which they know me very well because I think Lake Baikal is one of the most fascinating places on earth and by far my favorite lake. So I'm glad they picked it. So we're going to read about Lake Baikal, but we're also going to read about a few other things in this book. We're going to read about the Camargue and the Caspian Sea so that we can learn about other watery places around the world. So starting with Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is a huge inland sea home to many unique animals and plants. It lies in the province of Irkutsk in the Russian Republic of Buryatia in southeastern Siberia just north of the border between the Russian Federation and Mongolia. Lake Baikal is the oldest and deepest freshwater lake in the world, formed by huge earth movement about 25 million years ago. The crescent-shaped lake has an area of 11,780 square miles. It is 395 miles long and varies in width from 9 to 50 miles. Lake Baikal holds 5,500 cubic miles of water. This is about one-fifth of all the fresh water on the Earth's surface, and it makes Lake Baikal the world's largest single volume of fresh water. Cool picture there. Estimates of the lake's maximum depth vary from 5,315 feet to 5,715 feet. Rivers and Islands Half the water flowing into the lake comes down the Selenga River in the southeast. The rest comes from more than 330 other rivers and streams, many of them flowing from the surrounding mountains. Lake Baikal's only outlet is the Angara River, which flows westward from the lake's southwestern end. Lake Baikal has about 45 islands and islets, of which the two biggest are Olkon, about 270 square miles in area, and Great Ushkani, which covers only about 3.6 square miles. Olkon is a region of forests and grasslands that supports deer, brown bears, and a wide range of birds. Great Ushkani is rocky, the site of the largest rookery of Baikal seals. Many of the other islands are little more than rocks, used as roosts by water birds. Climate Because large bodies of water retain heat longer than land, the climate around Lake Baikal is much milder than in the rest of southern Siberia. Even in the depths of winter, the average air temperature is negative 6 degrees Fahrenheit, compared with minimum temperatures of negative 68 degrees Fahrenheit elsewhere in Siberia. In August, the average air temperature is 52 degrees Fahrenheit. The lake freezes over from January until May or June, but its surface temperature in August is between 50 and 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Clear Waters Lake Baikal's water is very clear because it contains very few mineral salts. From the surface, it is possible to see objects 130 feet below. This clarity is maintained by large numbers of planktonic animals eating floating debris. In spite of its great depth, the water in the lake is well mixed, and oxygen is plentiful even in the bottom waters. Species Diversity Lake Baikal is home to nearly 2,000 animal species at various depths, and hundreds of plants at or near the surface. 
more than half the species of plants and animals, some say more than 1,500 of them, are endemic, which means they're unique to this lake. This huge number is partly due to the lake's isolation from other bodies of water. Lake Superior in North America, a lake of similar size to Baikal but not so isolated, contains only four endemic species. Half the estimated 50 species of fish in Lake Baikal are gobies. Several other species, principally the omel salmon, as well as grayling, lake whitefish, and sturgeon are all heavily fished. The lake and its surroundings support more than 320 bird species, but there is only one mammal in the lake, the unique Baikal seal the only seal in the world that lives exclusively in fresh water. Look at these blobs. <laughs> so sweet. Let's read about them. The Baikal seals. Baikal seals live mainly at the northern end of the lake, where warm springs flow in about 1,300 feet below the surface. The springs make the water more comfortable for the seals, but more importantly, the nutrients they contain feed a healthy population of about 30 species of fish, which are the seals' prey. The Baikal seal is one of the smallest in the world, about 4.2 feet long and weighing around 175 to 200 pounds. Females are slightly smaller than males, and both sexes are silver gray with a yellowish belly. They live for an average of 50 years, compared with an average of 20 years for seals in the ocean. Baikal seals spend the summer mainly on land, gathering in herds on the lake shore from July to October. They return to the water for the winter. When the lake freezes over, the water is actually warmer than the air above it. Until the end of February, the seals spend almost all their time under the ice, coming up to breathe at air holes that they keep open throughout the winter. They can stay underwater for as long as an hour between breaths. From February onward, the seals spend more time on the frozen surface of the lake, diving through the air holes several times a day to fish. Baikal seals have been hunted by Russians since the mid-17th century. At that time, its main importance was as a trading route to China. Seals were hunted from sleds drawn by horses across the ice in winter, using spears or harpoons. In recent times, seals have been hunted with rifles from boats in summer, or sometimes netted to make them drown, as this causes less damage to the valuable skins. The seal population in the year 2000 was between 40,000 and 50,000. This represents a recovery from a period of overhunting in the 1930s, but is less than in a 1977 count, which found about 77,000 seals in the lake. Fishing Lake Baikal has been an important fishery since the 17th century. Today, stocks of sturgeon in particular are under pressure because the price of caviar, which is sturgeon roe or eggs, has risen steeply on the world market. Omel salmon is a popular delicacy in Russia, though not as well known as caviar in the rest of the world. Habitat Stress and Protection Today, the condition of the lake is deteriorating. The problems began in the mid-1950s, when the Soviet authorities built a pulp mill on the southernmost shore of the lake at Baikalsk. They believed that any discharge from the factory would be diluted by the enormous volume of water in the lake and would have little harmful effect. Unfortunately, they were wrong, and the pollutants have been harmful to the health of the lake and its inhabitants. The factory's main function is to bleach wood pulp to extract cellulose for the clothing industry. The byproducts from this process include large numbers and quantities of organic chlorine compounds. 
these are very slow to break down in the environment and because of the rapid circulation of water in the lake they affect even bottom dwelling animals there are signs of birth defects in the local human population possibly as a result of very high levels of chemicals harmful to animal life such as pcbs which are lubricants and paint thickeners and ddt which is an insecticide in the soil and water which have found their way into the human food chain. Lake Baikal's problems do not arise only from the pulp mill. The Selenga River carries pollution to the lake from the three large Mongolian cities through which it flows, and coal-burning factories in Sludyanka, west of Baikalsk, produce acid rain that affects the lake as well as the pine and larch forests on its southern shore. All this pollution is carried west from the lake down the Angara River. The Omul salmon is among the fish most affected by pollution in Lake Baikal. Its spawning has been severely reduced in recent years. Because the fish is a very popular food, it has brought the problem of pollution in Lake Baikal to the attention of the Russian people. Efforts to protect Lake Baikal began as long ago as 1916, when the Bargzinsky Nature Preserve was established. But after the Soviet regime took over in 1917, little progress was made. Much later, when people became aware of the threats to the lake, they began to protect its shores and its waters by creating nature preserves, where research can be carried out and where development is now prohibited. Between 1969 and 1986, five such protected areas were established. In 1987, they were all merged into one enormous preserve, covering 34,000 square miles. In this area, the Lake Baikal Coastal Protection Zone, which includes the whole lake and its surroundings, all the conservation work can be coordinated in a single grand plan. In 1996, this huge natural treasure house was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site, signaling that protecting Lake Baikal is recognized today as the responsibility of not just the Russian people, but of the whole world. The problems of pollution are still not solved, but at least they are recognized. To clean up the lake, laws have been passed to limit the discharge of harmful chemicals from factories. In time, the natural flow of water through the lake will carry the chemicals away and dilute them downstream. The fisheries can be protected and sustained only by controlling the amount of fish caught and ensuring that the fish taken are of adult size to allow them to breed before being killed and eaten. This conservation work now has international support, as more people understand the unique value and importance of Lake Baikal. Let's move on to another interesting watery place, the Camargue. Which you can see a cool picture down here, and here's a map of it here. The Camargue covers an area of 330 square miles of southern France. It lies on the delta of the Rhone River, bordering the Mediterranean Sea. In the north of the region, much of the land is dry, but in the south, there are large areas of marsh and shallow lagoons. River channels that flow through this area have embankments on both sides to prevent flooding of the surrounding low-lying land. Because the Camargue is on the coast, salt water plays an important part in its ecology. Many of the lagoons and marshes are brackish, which means partly salty. The amount of salt in the water changes depending on the tides, the water level in the rivers, and the distance from the sea. History of the Camargue The Camargue has changed greatly over the centuries. In Roman times, it was an area of grasslands and forests, but by the Middle Ages, the forests had been cut down for fuel and shipbuilding, and the land became increasingly barren. 
By the 18th century, the higher land was being drained and orchards and vineyards were being planted, followed later by cereal crops. Until the end of the 19th century, the wetter parts of the Camargue were infested with mosquitoes that carried malaria. As a result, the region was almost completely unpopulated. On the plains, herds of wild bulls and horses roamed. After World War II, attempts to grow rice in the wetter areas proved successful. Rice cannot grow in very salty water, so water flow was controlled to reduce salt levels in the lagoons. Key Habitats and Their Wildlife the wetlands in the south, including large areas of salt marsh, is an important habitat for wading birds. The lagoons, with their abundant wildlife, attract a wide range of resident species such as black winged stilts and avocets and are an ideal feeding ground for migrating birds traveling between Europe and Africa. The Atang de Vacare, at the center of the Camargue Nature Preserve, is the largest of the lagoons. It provides a nesting site for around 10,000 flamingos. The salinity of much of the water in the Camargue allows many specialized salt-loving plants to grow there. The Sansurier are low-lying salt plains, wet in winter and dry in summer. The most abundant plant here is glasswort which provides an important food for the grazing bulls and wild horses. In the drier areas around Arles, intensive agriculture has greatly changed the appearance of the land, although it remains inhabited by large birds such as red kites and eagles. The extensive fields of wheat and other crops are intersected by artificial water channels bounded with low dikes. A small area of forest has been preserved as a nature reserve. Although woodland is a very small part of the Camargue, it provides a home for mammals such as foxes and wild boar. And for insects, which are eaten by nesting birds. Extensive dunes are found along the coast. These low hills of sand offer a wide range of microhabitats. From the dry side of the dunes, where specialized plants such as marim grass take root, to the wetter areas between the dunes, where the remains of seashells have created alkaline soil conditions that suit many unusual and colorful plants such as orchids. Ecological Problems The Camargue has changed over the centuries. Species of animals and plants have come and gone but the speed of change has increased in recent years. A major concern is the threat of global warming. This may lead to rising sea levels, which would make the Camargue saltier and seriously affect its ecology. A decrease in fresh water due to reduced rainfall would make the problem worse. In addition, hotter summers would make some areas more likely to dry out or even be at risk from fires. Some scientists think that there will be more cases of severe weather with high winds and floods, as when in 1944 and in 1993, when the Grand Rune burst its banks, pouring huge quantities of fresh water into the salty lagoons. If this sort of event became common, it would seriously affect the balance of species in the Camargue. Agriculture is a cause of reduced biodiversity. Habitats are destroyed, and large fields with a single crop provide a poor food resource for wildlife. This is often made worse by the use of pesticides and herbicides. In particular, rice growing has had considerable effects on the wetter areas of the Camargue. Paddy fields can support some wildlife, but biodiversity is much lower than in uncultivated marshes and lagoons. Tourism can also cause problems. The Camargue, especially the coastal area, is popular with vacationers who come to enjoy the beaches. 
Tourists can damage habitats, particularly dunes, simply by walking over them. But they can also harm the Camargue in other ways, such as increased vehicle traffic, construction, and pollution. Protecting the Camargue in recent years, people have worried that the traditional landscape of the Camargue and its wildlife could disappear. Part of the area was turned into a nature preserve in 1927, and in 1970, the whole region was designated a regional natural park. Since then, some valuable wildlife habitats have been given protection, and parts of the Camargue are now closed to visitors, so the wildlife will not be disturbed. Rice growing in the Camargue is now less common because of low prices for rice. Salt water has been allowed back into unused paddy fields in an attempt to recreate salt marshes. Maintaining an area like the Camargue costs money. The best way to preserve the Camargue is to encourage ecotourism which provides the money needed to look after the area. It would not be possible to maintain the herds of horses and wild bulls without the money provided by tourists. Perhaps just as important, ecotourism helps to make people more aware of how the way they live their lives can affect delicate habitats, such as the Camargue. And lastly tonight, let's explore the Caspian Sea. The Caspian Sea is the world's largest inland sea, more accurately described as a brackish or saltwater lake. It lies on the border between Europe and Asia, enclosed by five countries, European Russia and the Asian continents, Asian nations, hello, of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Iran. The Caspian Sea is 750 miles long from north to south, 270 miles from east to west, and covers an area of about 143,550 square miles. The northern end of the Caspian Sea has an average depth of between 13 and 20 feet. The middle Caspian reaches a maximum depth, depth of 2,600 feet. The southern Caspian is the deepest part of the sea, extending down 3,363 feet. One sea, many climates. The northern part has a temperate continental climate, while the middle and southern regions are much warmer. The climate in the southwestern corner is subtropical, while the eastern shore, which is bordered by deserts, is very hot and dry. There, the summer temperature reaches a maximum of 111 degrees Fahrenheit. Over the rest of the sea, the summer air temperatures are between 75 and 79 degrees Fahrenheit, but in winter the temperature range is much wider from 14 degrees Fahrenheit in the north to 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the south. That's a little map of the sea there for you. Every winter, the northern end of the sea freezes, forming ice that is shaped into ridges and troughs by the wind. Most rain falls in winter and spring. Annual precipitation increases from the dry eastern shore, where it averages 8 inches to the damp southwest, which averages 67 inches. Perhaps the most surprising factor in the Caspian habitat is the amount of evaporation, which at the hotter end of the sea can reach 40 inches in a year. The salinity of the water is 12.8 parts per thousand on average, compared to 33 to 37 in the open oceans of the world. However, it varies widely in different areas of the Caspian. The sea is fed mainly by three rivers, the Volga, Ural, and Terek, all pouring fresh water in at the northern end. The Caspian has no outlet except loss of water by evaporation. Near the Volga Delta, the salinity is just one part per thousand, 
while in the huge, shallow Karabagazgol lake on the eastern shore, where evaporation is particularly rapid, it can reach 200 parts per thousand. This is the site of a major chemical plant that extracts valuable salts from the sea. Caspian Sea water contains large amounts of sodium sulfate and calcium and magnesium carbonate, all of which are important to industry when they have been extracted and purified. In 1980, in an attempt to reduce the loss of water by evaporation, a sand barrier was built to cut the amount of water flowing into the Karabagaz coal. This was supposed to create a lake that would supply chemical salts for several years. But by 1983, it had dried up completely. Meanwhile, the level of the sea on the other side of the barrier was rising by about six inches each year. A canal now allows water to flow into the Karabagazgol in controlled amounts, and scientists are trying to find other ways of keeping the water level steady. Pollution, too, is a problem for the Caspian Sea. Agricultural pesticides and harmful industrial byproducts pour into the rivers that feed the sea. The local oil industry, which started in the 1920s and was centered around the southwestern shore, has extended dramatically in the last 50 years. Today, huge oil and gas reserves are also being exploited at the northern end of the Caspian Sea in Kazakhstan. Oil spillage or leakage from the pressure caps on wells could create serious pollution or even an ecological disaster if oil entered the Caspian Sea. Life in the Caspian Sea about 850 animal and 500 plant species live in the Caspian Sea. This is a small number for such a large body of water, but many of them are endemic. The most conspicuous of the endemic animals is the Caspian seal, closely related to the ringed seal of the Arctic, but isolated in the Caspian for 500,000 years. After being pushed south from its Arctic origins, by Ice Age glaciers. Exploiting the variation in climate, the seals breed in winter on the pack ice in the frozen north, oh look how sweet, <laughs> and migrate in summer to feed in the warmer waters in the south. Humans hunt the seals for their skins, mainly in winter and spring. Overhunting caused the population to fall steeply in the middle of the last century. But hunting is now carefully controlled, and the seals maintain a flourishing population of about 450,000. Apart from humans, their main enemies are wolves, which range across the ice to take as many as 40% of the newborn pups, and about 1% of the nursing females. The seals feed on the rich population of fish mainly small species such as sculpins and gobies in winter and pike, perch, and carp in summer and fall. The Caspian Sea is also heavily fished by humans who compete with the seals for pike, perch, and carp. The really valuable catch, however, is sturgeon, the main source of caviar. The Caspian supplies four-fifths of the world catch, Salmon, too, are fished in huge quantities, and both sturgeon and salmon numbers have declined in recent years. Gray mullet were introduced as a commercial fishery, but their numbers, too, have fallen. Fishers blame seals for the decline in the catch, but a more likely reason for the falling catch is the rising level of pollution in the Caspian Sea. Since the 1950s, canals between rivers have linked the Caspian to the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, and the White Sea. Ships using the canals have brought in alien animal species in the form of the larvae of barnacles, crabs, and clams, which have made their home in the Caspian Sea. Although they provide food for the other residents, these newcomers will disturb the balance of the unique fauna of this isolated sea in ways that cannot be predicted. 
Like Lake Baikal and the Aral Sea, the Caspian Sea is an example of a large, isolated body of water that has been seriously affected by human activities over the centuries, until the qualities that make it unique are in danger of disappearing. And that is the end of our reading for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night.